It's really nice to have you all here. We will keep it going as people roll in. The session is recorded as a start. So welcome to the session of the Speakers Forge. This is a really near and dear topic to everyone and Ariel and to myself specifically. Um, we're going to be chatting about mental health. So if this makes you uncomfortable, um, there might be some things that are a little bit sensitive, you know, let us know. But um, I really am thrilled to welcome Skulk. It's going to be a really interesting session to see his journey into mental health and just being more vulnerable around mental health in the workplace. Um, and as someone who had to learn pretty much the hard way that I needed to manage my mental health in order to actually be a functional person, um, I highly recommend everyone takes a bit of time and spends a little oh bit God. with themselves on their topic. So as Scott mentioned, we do have a second speaker who unfortunately can't be with us live today. Um, he is currently in the USA and the time zone difference is just a little bit too much for our South African time zones. I will be sharing his video in the recording afterwards. So if you guys want to take some time to watch that, that deals with imposter syndrome and the challenges that you face with regards to imposter syndrome. Part of the reason why we wanted to have this session is duly because we are currently having our mental health awareness month within Dario. A huge shout out to Lucy, our marketing management uh, team, who's done so much work around this. It's something that I feel we need to remember we are not alone about. Um, the second component to this also came out of a recent meeting with one of our female women in tech meetups where Imposter syndrome really was highlighted as a big problem for a lot of people, especially in the consulting space. But I'm not going to steal too much of the starlight. I'm going to hand over to Skulk. If you guys have questions, please leave us questions. And mm. um, we will respond to them probably after the session. And we're going to let Skulk go and do all of his things. And I have released a little poll as well. So feel free to participate. We are on the chat. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Skulk, and for putting together all this effort to show and share with us. All right, cool. I'm going to turn off and let's get cracking. Cool, all right. So um, let me just open my slides. Sorry, uh, I'm really doing a number on kind of the professionalism of this talk. I uh, <laughs> My no, phone man. rang during the introduction and like I'm like actually only opening up my slides now. Um, but I, I guess it comes with the territory. Um, uh, let me just, so I think, let me maybe just start. And this is something I, I completely forgot um, yesterday um, when uh, we kind of did a bit of a dry run on this um, is that I kind of forgot to just do a bit of an introduction on me. So I have uh, some slides that I just reuse all the time. I, um, you know, I do quite a lot of teaching. Um, I do quite a lot of speaking and so forth. So um, I just have like, uh, like a set that I just use as an introduction. So um, yeah, first and foremost, um, who am I? Um, some of you might know me. Um, I know some of you here. Um, just looking at the attendees list. So first and foremost, thanks to everyone that joined. Um, yeah, it's 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 actually great that. Yeah, like I, it, it's great that there are people that are actually interested in kind of listening to someone speak about this. Um, I find that uh, so I co-host the Front End Development South Africa um, meetup, and I I find that like kind of the technical topics does really well, but whenever we kind of go into the world of you know these kind of more squishy things, um, then you know, like the attendance isn't that great. So it's, it's amazing to just see how many people pitched up. Cool, so who am I? Uh, as mentioned, I do quite a lot of teaching and training. Um, you know, I am very involved at uh, Cape Town Creative Academy. I kind of created the three year uh, um, interaction design program there. Um, and uh, code space uh, I'm currently lecturing at also um, involved this year with Codex, uh, Academy of Digital Arts, and then I've done some work for uh, Wits and Stellenbosch in the past. Um, 
I'm very involved in the community. Um, I so I kind of spend a lot of my time um, volunteering as an admin uh, on ZA Tech. Um, I think this is an old number. I think we're up to 13,000 people now at the moment. Um, then the same as well. I also help out with uh, ZA product design. Um, and then, as mentioned, I, I co-founded Frontend Development South Africa with uh, some good friends of mine. Um, and it's a registered nonprofit kind of that just hosts events around like kind of the front end community and so forth. Uh, yeah, you can check us out on Meetup. Uh, yeah, pretty involved in, in open source, uh, do a lot of open source work. Um, I've kind of contributed to all of these projects. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll see now that I have a daughter, <laughs> whether, whether I, like what's going to happen to my free time, whether I'm going to actually be able to spend time within the open source world, world still, um, when I need to start thinking about school fees and whatever. Um, yeah, uh, done a lot of contract work, uh, did some work for Google Foundation, uh, Design in Daba, um, worked for three years at Open Up, still do a lot of contract work for Open Up, very close to kind of the, the guys at Open Up, um, did some work for National Treasury, um, I've kind of did some commission work for CSS tricks, um, written material and so forth. Also wrote some articles for Daily Maverick and, and so forth. So I, I've kind of, and I kind of, I've been involved in a lot of things. Um, yeah, I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty restless in, in so far that um, I really, I really like um, kind of getting involved in new projects. Um, yeah, and then obviously I have a life outside of work. So yeah, I stay in Cape Town in the northern suburbs. Um, very Afrikaans. I'm very Afrikaans. Um, and as mentioned, I have a three year, three week old daughter, uh, Inga. Um, so yeah, if if you hear any baby noises, uh, some screaming in the background, um, yeah, that's probably her. So. <laughs> and then yeah I'm, I'm pretty active online um you can reach out to me on any of these platforms um i really enjoy speaking to people getting new perspectives um and so forth um and i, I think that's why i'm so drawn to the teaching as well uh, you know for those of you that are in tech know that um uh, like teaching salaries don't really compare to tech salaries um but it's, it's kind of something that I'm very passionate about that I, I kind of really enjoy. Um, so I, I really enjoy like understanding things and unpacking things, which is, I guess, the reason for this talk today. Um, yeah, so definitely reach out to me if you have any questions. If you just want to chat, um, I'm always keen to just meet new people and chat. Um, cool. So let's then get into the actual talk itself. All right. So... Um, So this is kind of one of those things, you know, so um, uh, Anine actually messaged me, she asked me, you know, if I can recommend anyone to um, do a talk on mental health. And yeah, like I've, I've been wanting to do one for a very long time, but for obvious reasons, like, and, and this is kind of part of what I'm going to speak about is, you know, like we, it's not a fun thing to talk about. Um, it's not only like, is there a lot of kind of shame uh, associated with it, but it's also, it's, it's, it's a kind of a novel thing in so far that there isn't a lot of people speaking about it. So you don't really have a lot of what you would call in the tech world uh, design patterns to draw on. So you can't say, okay, this is usually how a talk about mental health would go. <laughs> so I think that's also very daunting. Um, but so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a shot. This is the first time I'm formally speaking about it. Um, I've kind of spoken about it informally here and there. Um, yeah, and, and my I tend to take a very iterative approach to things. So my guess is in three years I'm probably gonna look back on this and be like, oh my word, I can't believe I said those things. I, I don't hope I hope no one took my advice. Um, so yeah, let's see how it goes. Um, I'll probably at the end of the session kind of have a have a much better idea of kind of how I can build on it and maybe what worked and what didn't work. Um, Cool, but I, I think within that thematically, you know, like the central theme for me here is kind of messiness uh, and the messiness of being human. 
and and the fact to kind of live in that messiness is, is an act of courage. I I think specifically those of us in the tech world who are kind of used to things being slick and refactored and debugged and nice and working perfectly and efficiently. Um, yeah, it's sometimes hard. Um, kind of dealing with the own messiness that comes from being a human. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about three things. Uh, why do we even talk about mental health? Uh, I mentioned, you know, why can't we just talk about building cool things? Why can't I just do a talk on React or how to build a, a, a app or, you know, like machine learning or whatever? Uh, why do we even, in terms of opportunity cost, why is it even worth talking about this? Um, and then I want to touch a bit on kind of what tech has taught me about being human. Um, I think that, you know, like tech gets a very bad rap and, and, and rightfully so. Like the tech sector is, it's like there's a lot of improvement that, that I don't want to say can happen, that needs to happen. Um, but I think there's also a lot of good things that I kind of learned in the tech sector that help me be a better human being. Um, and then I'm just sharing some helpful resources that kind of helped me um, through my journey. Cool. So yeah, as mentioned, why even talk about mental health? Um, so kind of when I when I kind of agreed to do this, um, so those of you that are on ZA Tech, um, there is a mental health channel there um, that I frequent quite a bit and I and I know a lot of the people there and I asked you know um, as someone who's kind of like within the tech world and, and and struggling with like mental health issues or so forth what would you what would you what would be valuable for me to share with people what, what advice do you have and um, and this is like this is definitely what I didn't want to hear um, but it's what I needed to hear is you know that um, like you can't do a talk like this without being vulnerable. You can't tell people, you know, um, you know, be vulnerable, talk about things like, like, should, like, don't, like, almost withstand the temptation of being ashamed and so forth. Um, but then I'm like not really sharing much of my own journey and and, and the things that I don't want to share. Um, you know, and in the tech world, you know. So yeah, this is just me right now. <laughs> and this is me this morning as well. Like, you know, it's like, don't let the demeanor fool you. Like, this is really hard for me to do. Um, yeah, but so as mentioned, like this whole principle in the tech world, like there's a, this is concept of eating the dog food. And that is just essentially, and it, it's a great excuse to include this video um, of a dog eating the human food, um, amongst other things. So within the tech world, there's this concept of eating the dog food, and that is just like to use your own product. Um, and that sounds like, okay, that makes sense. But the, the problem is that our own products are usually kind of inferior to the things that Google build or the things that that Microsoft builds or Apple builds, you know? So if you're working on a video chat platform or whatever, it, you know, like it's like, it's, it's not necessarily gonna be in your best interest to like actually not use Zoom or not use, but rather use your own platform. Um, yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's just essentially kind of a way of putting your, your, your what's it, your money where your mouth is. Um, and yeah, like it, it, there's, there's so many kind of stories about where this comes from, but um, like apparently it, it comes from some pet food um, company where the CEO had um, people eat the dog food during shareholder meetings. Once again, it sounds a bit too fantastic for me to be real, but um, I think the point here being that, you know, like a lot of people say that uh, dog fooding is unappealing and it should, one of the things on Wikipedia is it should be changed to ice creaming. And I, I kind of think that defeats the purpose, like eating your own dog food should not be a fun exercise. Um, it should be something that you don't want to do. Um, yeah, and in the same way, you know, Mark Twain, uh, when asked like, what should people write about? Um, he kind of responded by write what you know. And, you know, I, I know a lot about JavaScript. I know a lot about HTML and CSS product design. 
um, visual design, UI design, um, but there's nothing that I know quite as well as kind of living with mental illness. Um, and I very deliberately use the term mental illness. Um, in my support meeting, someone once asked me about that. And I, I think like calling it mental illness kind of really is kind of a way of stating it without kind of allowing yourself some wiggle room for people to think, okay, maybe he just really struggles with anxiety or maybe his temperament is just a bit more sullen or whatever. It's, yeah, I definitely acknowledge that what I have is something that's impacting my functional life if I don't manage it. Um, but yeah, so I know that intimately, I can speak to that. Um, but also Mark Twain said something about eating as well. Um, some of you might know this. He said, uh, if you eat a living frog first thing in the morning, um, like the worst part of your day is over. It's just, it's just downhill from there, up, downhill, uphill. I, I don't know, I always mix it up in Afrikaans. It's like afterant, which means it's easy. And in English, I think downhill is like, no, it's gonna get worse. So I always mix those up, um, but it's just easier from there. So, um, I think what I'm want to do now is I kind of want to eat that frog. Um, I want to share the part of this entire discussion that I'm the most reluctant to do, um, that I'm the most ashamed of. And that is like during a period where I was really struggling. So in 2014, so um, for those of you that know Reddit, well, now you know my username as well, uh, Broikis. Um, and like at first, I didn't want to put my username there because I was like, no, they're going to be able to read all my, like everything I ever commented. And because Reddit is one of those things, like the whole premise of it is that everyone's anonymous. But like then I also realized like this is, this is like the, the most, this is the thing that I the most least want people to see. So nothing is worse than this. Um, but yeah, so like, I think I responded to someone who mentioned that they're having body dysphoria about their chin or something. And like, at that point, I was really struggling with body dysphoria. Um, and for those of you that don't have experience with these type of things, I, I often equate it to bungee jumping. Um, whereas like cognitively knowing that you're not going to die doesn't make a difference. Um, like the answer isn't to, to, to convince the person that he's not going to die when he bungee jumps. It's not a mental exercise. It's, it's, it's kind of like the, there's kind of an emotional response. You're feeling something regardless of what you know to be true or what you can empirically know is the actual truth. Um, so yeah, so what I, let me just read it and it's full. Um, so um, I said, however, I'd like to let you know that I've started developing the same type of thoughts regarding my facial structure and features in January this year. So that was 2014. Um, for the first time at the age of 27, um, and I was 27 at that point, I woke up one morning and realized that my smile is skew. Um, the one corner of my mouth doesn't lift up when I smile. Um, and I fell into an episode of suicidal depression and not being able to sleep and eat and being convinced that people get uncomfortable in my presence due to my distorted face. Um, I actually went to a plastic surgeon and he mentioned that although I strictly speaking have a skew smile, you know, it, it, it's kind of still within the parameters of a normal face, like a normal face isn't perfect. But tell that to someone who's obsessive or, you know, struggles with intrusive thoughts. Um, and I said, and if I had to talk to him without pointing it out, he wouldn't even have noticed. Um, however, I kept on obsessing about it and soon developed additional reasons why my face looks strange and make people uncomfortable. You know, from my teeth being yellow, my features being asymmetrical and so forth and so forth. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the plastic surgeon essentially told me like, dude, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't need a plastic surgeon, you need a psychologist. Um, and yeah, and so I went to a psychologist um, in the hopes that he'll be able to help me either see these thoughts as distortions, delusions, or help me accept myself, make peace with it, should they be 100% true. So I still, at that point, I still entertained the fact that my face is so distorted that it makes people uncomfortable. Um, 
So uh, I mentioned also I only just started going, so I'm unable to say whether I'm actually making progress. But according to my psychologist, it's quite common for people with pre-existing social anxiety and an inclination towards low self-worth to develop crippling obsessions about their appearance. Uh, I don't know the extent to which this is applicable to you, but I think merely making the jump from I'm unattractive to I want to kill myself is indicative of something deeper that needs to be addressed by a mental health professional. Okay. Yeah. So I think I want to use that as a starting point, you know, like I think that is the, the part of my entire journey that I'm the most ashamed of. And I'm not ashamed of it for feeling it, but it's, it's almost like, I, like, I don't like it because it sometimes makes other people uncomfortable. And it's, it's so, yeah, like, I don't know, it's, 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 it's hard talking about it because you're kind of, yeah, you guys can probably imagine why it's not something that you want to tell other people, specifically in a public forum that's going to be you, uh, recorded on YouTube. <laughs> um, but, you know, luckily, um, I started, um, so I've tried numerous things over the years. Ciprolex really made a big difference, Ooh. specifically in terms of my obsessions. Um, it really, my, like, um, like, oh, there goes my light. Um, in terms of my, like, you know, obsessive compulsions and things, it really helped a lot. Um, still had a bit of a hard time, um, but it definitely got me to a point where I could, like, actually hold down a job. Um, and then 2017, um, after a really bad, like, into a relationship, I um, kind of went on Ben Law. And, and like, I'm on both of those still to this day, uh, daily. And it's made a huge difference in my life. I, I you know, I can't talk to um, whether, like, medication is right for anyone else or, you know, because I don't have, I only have a single experience and that's my own. Um, and and, and the, the literature on it is conflicted. But I can just say from my point of view, whatever it is, even if it's placebo or, or whatever, it made a huge difference in my life. I, I wouldn't, I would probably not be here anymore if it wasn't for that. Um, but yeah, as mentioned, you know, so this year, three weeks ago, my daughter was born and um, phew, like I, like at a certain point, I didn't think I would be able to hold down a full-time job. Um, so it's just, I don't know, like, uh, like, it's like things, things change and, and, and kind of, it gets easier, um, if you address it for what it's worth. Um, then I want to talk about this guy, uh, who's a lot more like interesting, more interesting than I am. Um, some of you might know him. Um, there's a documentary about him called, uh, the internet's own boy. Um, there's actually a sculpture made of him. Um, massive massive figure in the world of tech absolutely massive um you might know about some of these things he was very intimately involved in them so rss markdown which i use daily creative commons um you know like uh webpy um reddit that i mentioned earlier he was one of the co-founders also y combinator hacker news all of that stuff um yeah, progressive change campaign, research fellow at Harvard, yeah, loads of things. Like this guy, he was such a force in the world of tech um, and the intersection of tech and society and so forth. Um, but in 2013, like uh, news broke that he committed suicide. And so the kind of the general sentiment was that because he was getting sued, by uh, the US attorney for like an extreme overreach of the criminal justice system and whatever. Definitely check out like kind of um, the documentary if, if you're interested in this thing or read up a bit about it. It's a, it's a very interesting story, very thought provoking story. Um, but some people mentioned that, you know, like that's not the whole story, you know, um, sure like that attributed to a suicide, but majority of people don't, commit suicide when they kind of like kind of caught in a really intense like legal battle um, I guess like I, I can't say that but um he definitely indicated that he has some mental issues at several points but he didn't really he kept it kind of hidden 
Um, and one thing that a lot of people mention is, you know, the specific blog post of his called Sick in 2007. And he essentially says, I have a lot of illnesses. I don't talk about it much for a variety of reasons. I feel ashamed to have an illness. It sounds absurd, but there's still an enormous stigma around being sick. Um, yeah, and, and a lot of personal close friends um, have kind of commented that, yeah, he did indeed struggle with depression and, and things. And so it's, it's interesting how someone that kind of has this legacy and that is so involved in the world around him and building things and sharing and, you know, contributing to things like kept this part of himself hidden. And yeah, there's a really good book about this called The Noonday Demon, uh, An Atlas of Depression um, by Andrew Sol Solomon. Um, it's quite a thick book, but it's a great read. Um, and he talks about this and he says, you know, like the cost of being ashamed about these things is that we have all these people walking around in invisible wheelchairs and invisible body costs, like the mental equivalent of like a wheelchair or whatever. And like kind of going through agonizing lives day in, day out, and no one even knows about it. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I definitely know at least two people in my life where you would have never thought that they kind of struggled with emotional issues. And, and then like one day you just hear they committed suicide and, and then everything starts coming out that, you know, oh, like their husband knew, but like they didn't want to tell anyone. And yeah, it's sure, like it's, it's, it's tough to struggle with these type of things. I'm very fortunate that I tend to be a but open about it. Um, I can't imagine struggling with this and having to deal with it on your own with no help. Um, yeah, but you know, like, uh, as you've probably guessed, um, as people in the tech industry, we need to be better. Um, there's a really great survey called uh, the Open Source Open Sourcing Mental Health uh, Organization. They do a yearly survey. And so they have two questions that I find very interesting in their survey. And this is from last year, uh, 2020. So they ask, would you feel more comfortable take, talking to your coworker about your physical health or your mental health? Majority of people said physical health. Uh, Lowish numbers said, you know, they're comfortable talking about either. And a very small minority said, like, they're more comfortable talking about their mental health than their physical health. This is insane. Um, and then, like, here's another thing. This is, to me, even worse. Like, there's a question around, have you observed or experienced a supportive or well-handled response to a mental health issue in your current or previous workplace? It's literally just asking where you're working now or any place in the past where you worked. Have you seen or experience. You don't even need to be the primary person here at play. You might have just seen it. Like an uh, actual response to a mental health issue be have a positive outcome. And it is absolutely insane that the majority, a large majority of people said um, no, or maybe you're not sure. Um, sure, like that, that's very demoralizing. You know, this is like in your entire career. That I think this just so shows like how much better we have to be at this, you know, if we have this around, like, let's say someone is diagnosed with cancer and the majority of people said, like, when someone's diagnosed with cancer, um, like the outcomes of that discussion at the workplace, uh, it didn't go down well. Like, it, yeah, like it, it's insane to me. Um, yeah. And then like a lot of people are reporting that it's actually getting worse. Um there's a company, there's an article by The Verge uh, titled How Tech Companies Are Ignoring the Pandemic's Mental Health Crisis. Yeah, as with everything, COVID has just made the problem a lot worse, um, especially with people now working remotely and whatever. Um, there's like, it's even harder to just speak about these things. Um, and like, yeah, I, I kind of like this quote. I just included it because I like it and it's relevant. Um, so Andrew Solomon says, depressed people cannot lead a revolution because, the, because depressed people can barely manage to get out of bed and put on their shoes and socks, <laughs> which I found like, is such a great quote. Um, but then like, you might be thinking like, okay, cool. I'm, I'm sorry about your struggle skulk. And, you know, uh, I wish you all the best. And um, I'm sorry that you have to deal with this. But, you know, like, like, th this isn't, luckily, I don't have this problem. And um, 
So fortunately or unfortunately, uh, the general consensus is that, you know, uh, mental illness and mental health, general mental health is kind of points on a continuum. There's no threshold where you, so the, the diagnostics is purely for like medication and treatment and so forth. But in actuality, it's a continuum. There's no point where now you're clinically depressed or now you're just like someone who has a bit of a melancholic, uh, yeah, me melancholic um, like temperament or whatever. Um, yeah, so like I, I, like I generally find that even, um, even if you don't like, it's not, things that you struggle with isn't of a pathological nature I, I i find that people still actually find benefit from it because uh, i think if you're struggling with these things you're just you're just experiencing the same things that that other people experience but in a much more extreme version of it um but like the 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 the, the basis of anxiety the basis of um self-loathing of, of of feeling like everything is meaningless or whatever. It's the same, it's just the intensity of it that differs. Um, and uh, I, I told, <laughs> I said last night I should change this, um, but I never got around to it. Um, and there's also a growing body of evidence that suggests that, you know, diagnostically burnout and depression like is diagnostically, there's no significant diagnostic difference between them. There's no way for a medical person to tell the difference between someone who's burned out and someone who suffers from clinical depression. Um, so yeah, the, you might also be experiencing some of these things at some point in your life, especially in the tech sector, um, but maybe more acutely. Um, yeah, and then lastly, you know, like I, I always try and include selfish reasons for these things. Um, when I talk about accessibility as well, web access accessibility and so forth, I kind of think like, okay, cool. If if none of these things compel you, um, is there maybe like a kind of a selfish reason to care? And and I think my for web accessibility, um, my kind of selfish reason that I usually put forth is, you know, we're all gonna get old someday. Um, our eyesight is going to deter, our hearing is going to deter, our, our motor skills are going to deter, and I would still like to use the internet one day. So it's in my best interest now to build an uh, accessible web. Um, and here, like, you know, if you, you don't really care about these things, you're like, cool, cool story. Sorry to hear about that, but, you know, not my problem. Um, yeah, like I think one thing that should be noted is that, you know, a large majority of people <clears throat> who struggle with these things have noted that it severely affects their productivity. So if you're a manager, if you own a business, if you have people working under you and, you know, like they are struggling with mental health issues, like um, that has a massive impact on their, their um, productivity, which then kind of has an impact on you. Um, yeah. And like, I also like this quote, uh, it's by kind of a sci-fi author. I, I, I really enjoy sci-fi work. Um, it's a book called Shipstar. Um, and the quote essentially just goes that, remember that people break down to not just mach machinery. All right. So now I'm getting into what tech taught me about being human. Cool. So I'm gonna try and speed it up a bit. Um, yeah, as always, I, I, I tend to include too much material because I just want to talk about everything. Um, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that this is during lunchtime. So, um, yeah, so uh, those of you might know the show For All Mankind. Uh, it's a really great show. Uh, it's I think it's on Apple TV, so it's not available in South Africa. I'm not saying that I didn't pirate it um, because it's not available in South Africa, but I'm also not saying that I didn't. So take that for what it's worth. Um, it's a great show. It's it's kind of, if, if you enjoy something like The Man in the High Castle, it's it's really up that alley. And so there's an actual review of it in which I say uh, Chris Marshall, who plays a human computer and astronaut. And so for some people, that sentence might be a bit weird. Human computer turned astronaut. What does that mean? Like, is she like a cyborg or something? Or, you know, an android or whatever? And so, actually, no. So, uh, the first computers were actual humans. And it was an actual occupation. You could be a computer. 
um, goes all the way back to 1613. Uh, this is also a great book, How to Speak Machine. Um, I highly encourage you guys to give this a read as well. Uh, here's an example of human computers. Uh, so yeah, this is where the term computer comes from. So uh, a computer used like what we know today as a computer was just an electronic computer in the same way that, you know, we had phones and we had cell phones. Um, but now cell phones is the actual, the primary version of the thing. Um, kind of like we had electronic computers um, and now we kind of just refer to them as computers. But this is what a computer used to be for a very long time. Um, and what's very interesting is because of this, it, it was mostly, a, it was almost exclusively a job done by women. Um, and that meant that the, the world's first professional computer programmers were women. Um, programming initially was seen as, as, as a, a woman's job. Um, and obviously that's a very far cry from today. Um, you know, this is just some stats from the office in state of the developer nation um, survey uh, in which, you know, like if you just look at that difference between male and female, you know, thinking that it's like a 50-50 split in terms of actual men and women that like, yeah, that is, doesn't look that great. Uh, the the race one seems like oh that looks a bit better but also remember that like you know like and you know it's hard to talk about this but um you know like why like it, it's a strange talking about white people but that's actually uh, having worked with with the government and uh, so forth quite a lot um it's interesting they just like their definition is a white person not caucasian or whatever a white person and a black person <laughs> so that's the official categorization but anyway so you know like it's, it, we make up nine percent of the industry uh, nine percent of south africa less than nine percent so you know like within that context it is insane just like how not diverse the tech sector is um i just want to like kind of mention this you know it's an interesting jumping point from kind of the world like this fact that initially programmers were all women um and i've kind of also kind of learned burnt my fingers quite a bit where i've realized that it's not my place to talk about it uh, even if I try and be helpful. Um, so I don't want to dive into it, but like, it's just worth sharing that. And like, if you're interested in this topic, check out this book called Technically Wrong. Um, it's a great read on, on that. Um, cool. But so let's get back to this part. Um, so obviously, why did we invent electrical computers? And, and the reason is, you know, humans are very limited in, in terms of what we can do. Uh, we tend to make a lot of mistakes uh, compared to the computers that we have today, like the worst entity that you can have to do this type of task is a human. Um, you know, so if you look at the Wikipedia page for computer, uh, you'll see in brackets occupation, um, like this usually involved very long and tedious calculations, used to like be extremely tedious, used to take a lot of time, and it was so error prone that you usually had two teams checking the results independently so that you can kind of uh, cross reference and see if it's actually correct. Um, and I also find it interesting that, you know, uh, when we actually started like creating electronic or electric uh, computing devices, that the first recorded bug was an actual moth. Um, this is a picture of it. And this is also where the term bug comes from. Um, like it's almost as if bi biology is just like not like it's kind of just trying to still stake its claim. Like, no, <laughs> this is still the age of the organism, like trying to stop computers. Um, yeah, but, you know, like as mentioned, you know, the problem with humans is that comparatively to um, the computers we use today, we're slow, we're inconsistent. And like there's certain mistakes that humans make that we can with certainty say that a computer would never make. Um, so computers are consistent as well. Um, you know, when there is a problem, you know, talking about bugs, it's usually by human error. Um, and it's interesting, so in, in How to Speak Machine, uh, John Madia, he used to be the head of design, I think, at WordPress uh, at some point. Um, 
he talks about computers as these meta mechanical machines, you know, that never tire, they, they, they don't necessarily have the same surface friction that like mechanical things have. Um, and like he refers to the non computing world as the living, tiring, creaky, squeaky world. And I really enjoy that. That's a, like, that's such a nice, like kind of almost metaphor for me to think about it as, you know, like, um, and we sometimes forget that, you know, like the, the tools that we use um, and kind of the way like we, we approach things in our day to day work. We, we sometimes forget that we are made from completely different material. Um, we kind of come from the, the creaky, tiring, squeaky world where you have atrophy and things can only do a certain thing for so long until it like isn't able to sustain it. You know, in, in the world of computing, you can run a for loop as long as the computer's powered on. Um, you can come back in 10 years and it would probably still run. Um, yeah, so I think it's fitting that like the tech industry is kind of like the industry that suffers the most from burnout. Um, you know, so there's another survey um, conducted with about 12,000 uh, people in the tech industry and about 58% 50, of them said that they are currently suffering from burnout. This is mind blowing. Uh, you know, thinking that, um, you know, like in, in that previous thing I quoted, burnout is diagnostically similar to depression. Um, like the symptoms seem similar looking from the outside. Um, so that means, this means that the minority of people in the tech sector are not currently suffering from burnout. Like that is, that's absolutely insane. Um, yeah, and it like kind of uh, looking at the Wikipedia page for burnout, like kind of burnout is primarily caused between a mismatch between kind of what you feel is expected of you and what you feel you can actually do. And I think like the reason why the tech industry suffers so much from this is because of this, is because our tools are not made from the same material that we are made of. So we're kind of expecting our coworkers, expecting our colleagues, expecting our managers, our juniors, to function like machines, to function like in the same manner that everything else that we encounter in our workplace functions. And I, yeah, it's obviously like, I don't need to explain to you why that's problematic and, and why that results in, you know, 58% of people currently struggling with burnout. Um, but so I found a lot of insight in this, uh, in the world of product design. Um, so a lot of you might know the Lean Startup. Um, and it also looked at, you know, I, I think there's a lot of parallels between kind of like the fact that people in the tech industry as individuals are so struggling and burning themselves out and just like, like digging themselves into holes and whatever. And we see the same phenomenon happening with startups. You know, if you just think about like how many startups actually fail, you know, how many of them just end catastrophically. It's, it's actually a very small number that actually succeed. And he said like one of the reasons is that we build things in a way that even tiny errors can lead to catastrophic outcomes. Like we don't anticipate, pro we don't make enough, we don't leave enough room for the kind of bugginess, bugginess of humans and humans making decisions and so forth. Um, that the moment someone makes an incorrect assumption or something, the whole thing comes crashing down. Crashing down. Um, and what I really like about the Lean Startup, so, you know, there's loads of books about like how to, you know, not work harder, but work smarter or whatever. And I've never really kind of resonated with that because to me now that places the blame on you again. It's like, not only are you lazy and you're not working hard enough, but you're also dumb and you need to be smarter. You're not, you need to get smarter and it's your own fault that you're struggling so much. Um, and what I like about like, like the kind of the lean approach is so for those of you that are familiar with it, it, it starts with the assumption that we're really bad at making decisions and that we can't trust ourselves. We need to view our decisions with a certain amount of skepticism. We're going to get something wrong the first couple of times we try it until we eventually figure out what we need to do. Um, and what's interesting is he kind of says you should aim for failure. 
Um, so like, I'm just going to read this quote in its entirety. So at this point in our careers, my co-founders and I are determined to make new mistakes. We do everything wrong. An early product that is terrible, full of bugs and crash your computer. Yes, really stability problems. Then we ship it to customers way before it's ready. Um, yeah, so like, I, I really like this approach of actually like doing worse, <laughs> not, not, not pushing yourself to be better, but, but doing worse. Um, having a worse output um, and like this really kind of resonates for me with kind of something shared by John Madia as well you know um, where he said we need to renounce the tradition that design ought to aspire to completeness um, and like if you're not familiar with lean a lot of this might sound like a really counterintuitive um, and I'll explain it in a second um, and, and here's a bit of a hint, you know, he mentioned we need to work incrementally um, and strive to be underwhelming. Um, and that, and so that, first of all, that's very hard for us because we have egos. We don't like putting things out there that we're ashamed of and so forth. Yeah. But essentially within the startup world and within product design, like this fear of having of visions not like having an idea that gets criticized and we get shamed for it and people think we're stupid and whatever is actually harmful to the process. Um, if we are able to move past that, um, then like that tends to have a lot better outcomes. And so you might think like, okay, so this is just like kind of a YOLO approach. You just do something, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. And, and that's also not the, the solution. Um, because that's also a dangerous approach, um, whether you're applying that to a product that you're designing or just personally, like your own kind of mental health and kind of expectations you put on yourself. Um, and the key here is a commitment to iteration. So you put out something that's really underwhelming. You put out something that has a lot of missing things. You know, you put out something that's messy. And this is where we get to the mess. You put something that's messy, incomplete, that, you know, like still needs a lot of work. You're unsure whether it's actually good or not, um, but you make a commitment to iterate. And you, you assume that initially the feedback you're gonna get isn't gonna be that great, but that's gonna guide you in the right direction. And you, you make a commitment that regardless of the feedback that you get, you're gonna use that feedback to, um, you know, and, and use those feelings of, you know, like insecurity and so forth to actually guide you in terms of how you should iterate. Um, he talks about, uh, we're kind of free now to gain a more perfect understanding of what we should be doing instead of, aiming to just get it right from the beginning. Um, and this actually ties in quite well for me with a specific therapeutic um, methodology that really resonates with me called acceptance and commitment. It's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a permutation of uh, CBD, which is CBT, <laughs> CBD is Cape Town, uh, CBT, which is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. So essentially uh, ACT says, you know, you accept something, so you don't try and eliminate it. Whether you're feeling anxious, you're feeling uh, insecure, you're feeling that you're feeling ashamed, whatever, you accept it. You don't try and get rid of it. And then given that you've accepted it, you decide, given that this is now a thing, where do I move from here? What would be the next productive step? Um, yeah, and, and you know, that's, you know, this is very much like thanks on cured territory. Um, it, obviously, it's not that easy, but it's like this is the goal. And, and there's a lot of like practices that you can do to kind of help move towards a space where this is kind of like how you kind of um, deal with difficult feelings. Um, and part of it is not avoiding situations where they are kind of where they come up. And I find the same with product, uh, product development um, and product design, you know, uh, we want to keep things hidden, hidden, hidden until we're sure it's perfect and polished and whatever. And then we want to show it to people and say, hey, and because we're scared, they're going to say this sucks. This is missing. What the hell is going on here? But the problem is when things are in that vulnerable state, they are the most malleable. We're, we, we, we have the most power to make changes. And it's the same for me with 
myself and you know kind of the issues that I struggle with when I try when I'm really experiencing them and I'm the most ashamed to share them and I'm feeling the most scared to be vulnerable like that's the time I need to be because that is a time where I'm still malleable where I still haven't kind of solidified how I'm going to deal with this or kind of solidified my understanding or developed like unhealthy coping mechanisms and so forth um yeah great ACT resource is called the happiness trap um essentially it can be summarized as the harder we try um, to get rid of bad feelings, the more we create. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, just shortly, you know, also like the, the answer isn't working harder, whether that's personally in dealing with your own mental issues or whether that is um, designing a product or, or yeah, uh, running a startup or whatever. Um, the problem is actually that we are trying too hard already, but we're trying too hard at the wrong things. Um, yeah. And as I mentioned, you know, like a big problem is that we postpone getting data on something, whether it's a product or it's kind of things we are struggling with or, or you know, kind of just make things we're making sense of um, that we postpone getting any feedback on it until we're certain that it's not going to come across as messy or weird or going to embarrass us. And like the problem there is that by the time we finally get data on it or we finally get feedback on it, um, it's, you know, like it's, we've already solidified so many behaviors and built so many things on assumptions made around that. And, and I think in my life, if I didn't start seeing that psychologist when, um, I started developing these issues and when the plastic surgeon told me like listen you need to talk to someone dude like this is there's something really wrong here if i just went home and i was just like screw that guy he doesn't know what he's talking about um yeah like i would have definitely i assume not be today where i am um and you know like once again you know this this comes back to this notion that we have of ourselves in the tech industry where we kind of think we need to be the same way as the tools that we use um like we're not allowed to be messy we're not allowed to make mistakes we're not allowed to um kind of get things wrong um and yeah i don't want to go too much into this he just mentions that you know uh like it actually sounds like saying that like making the switch to gaining a better understanding, figuring out what are productive steps to take instead of just pushing yourself in terms of actually like trying. Um, he says that's actually harder. It sounds like it's easier, but it's actually harder. Um, yeah, and, and he also says that um, it, it gets harder before it gets easier because we've kind of become so accustomed to the way that we do things um that we no longer actually see the 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 kind of problems associated with it and then when we switch things up immediately we see all the new problems that come up um we're kind of used to all the old problems so it, it yeah and remember he's talking here about product design he's not even talking about mental health um but i find like like designing a product is such a human experience that there's so many parallels just in terms of how you approach other things in your life um and you know and to that point you know so this little circle thing on the cover of the book it's, it's actually called uh Enso. Um, i'm probably butchering the pronunciation um it comes from the world world of buddhism um and it's actually you draw it with your hand but in one quick motion you don't go and try and get it perfect you just do a quick circle um you know and it speaks to like asymmetry and irregularity and so forth so comparing that to kind of like our expectations around like computers and, and the tech world and where things are slick and polished and whatever you know like this is probably how like a, that type of circle would look and then we get into that world and we look a bit like this um and yeah like obviously this is kind of where that um discomfort comes in and and, and that kind of feeling that i'm not allowed to be like this comes in um so back to kind of like this like buddhism is you know so i at some point in my life i, I was at a really bad place i um i just kind of broke off an engagement and um 
yeah, like I was really having a hard time. And I, I started going to this um, center in Salt River. They are across Grotesquier Hospital. And um, like, uh, I think this is something that really struck me. So one of the people once told me that you can't see here on the side, but there's like symbols as well. And one of these symbols is a peacock. And he kind of shared with me that, um, like the reason for the peacock being there is that one of the things about peacocks is they eat snakes. Like that is like the most metal thing ever. Like peacocks actually eat snakes. And not only do they eat snakes, they eat poisonous snakes. Um, and it doesn't do much to them. Um, and like there's some symbolism in that in, in so far that um, this thing that like, like sitting with this negative stuff um, like like something that's poisonous or whatever and and using it kind of as nourishment instead eating it like making it food and feeding off it um, you know and growing from that um, like there's something like really like a nice analogy there there's even a book uh, peacock in the poison grove So obviously uh, what happened is there was some load shedding um, and by the magic of video editing, I now have a different outfit and my beard has grown a bit and also the time of day has changed a bit. Um, but, you know, I think in the spirit of like embracing the messiness and then sticking with the messiness, um, I guess I couldn't have hoped for <laughs> for a better outcome than having load shedding interrupt the middle of uh, my talk. Um, yeah, like, uh, not gonna lie, wasn't the most, like, it wasn't really how I planned it to go, but I, I think it, it gives me an opportunity myself to kind of get comfortable with kind of, you know, like have some type of, I, I think in, in the world of acceptance and commitment therapy, they talk about, um, emotional flexibility um, and emotional resolve or um, resilience, not resolve, re resilience. Um, yeah, so being able to kind of like, you know, not being too rigid, being able to like kind of stretch and squeeze and, and deal with messy things as they come up. Um, cool, so I think if I remember correctly last time uh, where I ended, I ended uh, talking about peacocks, specifically uh, peacocks uh, eating poisonous snakes. And um, so there's something, I think, beautiful for me in, in, in this notion that um, you have this creature that consumes venomous things and actually uses it to kind of feed itself and to kind of grow and, and kind of transforms it into something productive and constructive. Um, so I think then I kind of started speaking or I was about to speak before the power came off that, you know, like this is necessarily, I, ooh, I should actually just disable my Slack. So give me a second. <laughs> Once again, you know, uh, really doing a number on uh, professionalism here, but, um, yeah, I think once again, like the, the, the more messiness happens, probably uh, the stronger of a case I'm making. Um, yeah, so I kind of spoke about kind of the ENSO and, you know, kind of it's, it's placed within the world of kind of Zen and Buddhism and so forth. And I also spoke about kind of like this uh, Buddhist center that I went to, but, um, you know, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from these things, but um, they're quite universal, like this concept of, of, of dealing with the messy bits of life. Um, you know, so obviously my own tradition, you know, so I, I come from a Christian tradition, um, and I think there's a lot of theology on, on this concept of kind of messiness and, you know, um, this concept of, I almost want to say, like, dirt or the, 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 the unclean. Um, and, you know, something, someone that I really follow closely on this that I'm a really big fan of is a guy called Richard Beck. He is a experimental psychologist. Uh, I think he's a professor. Um, at a university in, in the States. And he's also an amateur, amateur theologian. So he kind of, he's primarily actually works within this field of, of discussed psychology, which is actually like a, such an interesting field. Um, and he kind of like writes a bit like on kind of like this, like 
his own, I almost want to say, making sense personally of this concept of, you know, disgust and like how this concept of disgust kind of permeates kind of our entire existence. Um, and like so as, as social beings, as like as beings with their inner personal life and so forth. And he obviously frames it within the context of the Christian tr tradition. And so he talks about kind of like these two tensions between like purity and, you know, like clean and unclean, um, you know, talking a lot about like the book of Leviticus and, and so forth. And then he kind of juxtaposes it to this concept of like uh, grace or mercy, which is kind of, you know, like, like reconciling kind of like the, the the expelled or the unclean and the the clean and kind of the 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 pure um yeah so he said you know kind of mercy blurs this distinction uh bringing the clean and unclean into contact so you know there's kind of a um what would be the word there's kind of a reconciliation there um like and and, and kind of like he specifically speaks to how the Christian tradition allows us to kind of reconcile the parts of ourselves that, that we don't like or that we don't want to show the world or so forth to reconcile that back into our own identity and kind of take ownership of it and, and make peace with it and, and, and so forth. Um, yeah, so he speaks very much to this. Um, obviously, this this translates to the level of kind of our personal lives. It, it translates to how we relate to others. Um, you know, like he primarily frames it in terms of how we relate to others. So, in, in, in like you'll see this this the tagline of the book is meditations on purity, hospitality, and mortality. So, you know, kind of like this concept of you know like hospitality and, and your neighbor and, and so forth. Um, but yeah, so I, like I mentioned that he does a bit of work in discuss psychology as well. And, and discuss psychology is one of those things that's you wouldn't think it's interesting, but once you dive into it, it is it's so interesting. And it, it's just crazy how much of our inner world and our outer world it actually permeates. Um, and what's interesting about disgust is it's actually a primary emotion, one of the six primary emotions. So to kind of frame that, um, you know, anger is a secondary emotion. So disgust is kind of more primitive, is a much more primitive reaction to, as opposed to something like anger, uh, which is insane to think, you know, we, we don't necessarily think about disgust as such a kind of primal impulse. Um, you know, and obviously it comes evolutionary, it comes from this place of being disgusted by things that are hazardous to us, so foods, um, people that are sick, smells, those type of things. Um, but the problem is, and, and specifically because this came out of the evolutionary system, is that it tends to overgeneralize. It tends to err on the side of being too easily disgusted. And, you know, to quote directly from the Wikipedia page, you know, um, it is more costly to perceive a sick person as healthy than it is to perceive the healthy person as sickly. Um, so, you know, from a survival aspect, you know, the fact that our disgust impulse is so tightly tuned and it does like, we are too easily disgusted. Um, actually, from a survival perspective, is, is actually a good thing. But as most things, you know, um, that may be helped from an evolutionary perspective, whether it is anxiety or stress or whatever, kind of gets in the way of modern life. You know, you know, there's always these uh, like like kind of um, analogies about you know, like if you're facing like a saber toothed tiger or whatever, um, you know, like then it's super helpful when you are in commute and you're walking into the office and sitting at a desk and so forth, these kind of primary emotions sometimes get in the way. Um, and once again, you know, if you're kind of scavenging for food and whatever, uh, disgust is a great thing to have. Um, when you're working within a society and you're kind of navigating kind of like all these structures, social structures and kind of your own personal like um, inner life and so forth, disgust gets in the way quite a bit. Um, and it's interesting, you know, because it's such a primary impulse, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big link between disgust and those of other things. So, you know, um, like the research has found that people who are more sensitive to, to disgust um, tend to kind of um, have more negative attitudes towards 
out groups, uh, so kind of the other people, um, whatever that may be, um, or whether that takes the, 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 the dimension of kind of a minority group, or, you know, I guess even something as uh, like a, a competitor company, or, um, you know, if you're a developer, uh, designers, and likewise, if you're a designer, developers. <laughs> um, yeah, so they tend to have more negative attitudes towards the out groups. Um, and also people that um, are suffering from major depression um, has, have also been found to display like greater brain activation um, to facial expressions of disgust. So there's a very clear link between kind of a very sensitive tuned um, impulse to like, like disgust impulse and kind of a lot of like almost want to say um, forms of neurosis and you know medical uh, mental issues so whether that is you know like OCD which is kind of obviously a lot more apparent or even things just like self-worth and so forth um, yeah and, and, and there's a pretty clear link between um, people that are easily disgusted physically by things and people who feel a sense of shame very easily um, you know, and in psychology, they talk about like kind of this concept of toxic shame, uh, which is just like shame that's not helpful. It's actually impeding. It's actually paralyzing. Um, so for me, this is something that I had to deal with quite a bit. Um, and, you know, part of that is kind of confronting the messiness of things, confronting the messiness of myself, you know. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a very like abstract kind of aspect to it. But because, you know, of this... Um, notion of like disgust evolving from this very um, tactile kind of sensation um, and tactile response to like things that are rotten and so forth. Um, like there's a lot we can learn from that impulse. And, you know, like, so you can imagine that um, when you are kind of unhappy with aspects of yourself, parts that um, I think I had a, had a manager at one point that, um, said something along the lines, it's always stuck with me that, you know, um, it was an Afrikaans and it was, you know, along the lines of, I'm all a dealer from the South, I believe in the South, I'm a swart sack and hoi in the You know, and, and that's essentially the thing, you know, to me, like, how do you reconcile those parts of yourself with kind of the ideal of who you think you are or who you would like to be? And it, it, it's, becoming more clear and clear um, within research and anecdotally for myself as well that the the more we try and pretend that isn't there or the more we try to hide it the worse it actually gets you know and and there's a lot of parallels for me there between that and the world of product design where if we're striving too hard for perfection if we're spending too much time getting something perfect and not kind of putting it in front of people, getting feedback, kind of being open, like, listen, this is where we're at. We're trying to figure things out. What do you think? What do you think? You don't try and hide it. Um, I think like that tends to have better outcomes within the world of product design as well, because that's when things are the most malleable. That's when you can make changes and you haven't committed to the direction too much. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things for me there. Like, I think as I learn to become more honest, as a product designer and like um, to kind of be more open to feedback and like on my best days, um, actually pursue negative feedback um, and not try and avoid negative feedback. Um, like I found that to have really great implications in terms of the outcome. And I think I've kind of realized that there's a lot of value to that for me personally as well, is not only to not be scared of like kind of appearing imperfect or getting criticized or, you know, being disliked or feeling that, oh, you know, I almost want to swear, like, oh, man, <laughs> oh, man, like, oh, I, I said this really embarrassing thing or, oh, sure, that code that I wrote, you're off there probably thinking, who, who the hell is this guy? Um, you know, the more I get comfortable with that, and the more I kind of not only allow myself to be messy and like to, you know, not appear perfect, um, I found like actually that tends to have better concrete outcomes. Um, you know, and so like 
Richard Baker also kind of speaks to this, but he also speaks to this from a sociological point of view. He talks about kind of, it's interesting, he calls it the ethic, which means that, you know, like it's almost like our, in Western society, our, our notion of kind of purity and perfection and, and, and so forth is almost, you know, and I like the like intentionality between using the word ethic is that it's almost like it, it becomes a moral thing. There's the, we start kind of creating like a link between, um, you know, not appearing flawed or not having shortcomings or not being broken or imperfect as a question about our own morality, um, goodness or badness. Um, and it's interesting what he remarks is that, you know, generally we, we don't consider success as much by what people achieve, but by the actual shortcomings or visible shortcomings that they don't have, you know. So, for example, you can achieve a million things, but if you if it comes out that you have addiction or something, all of a sudden that negates everything else. So it has a lot more to do with kind of the 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 imperfections and 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 not have appearing to have imperfections than it actually has about achievements and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, once again, he, he talks about how do we reconcile this kind of um, this almost personal dirt, so the messiness of ourselves that we don't want to be there, that we want to get rid of, that we want to pretend isn't there, um, you know, and like he obviously frames it within in the Christian perspective around like grace and mercy and um, forgiveness and so forth and, and, and kind of hospitality, like saying, you know, this is part of me, I kind of, you know, I'm obviously going to work around it, I'm going to try and practically work around it, but this is part of me. You know, this is this is this is who I am. This is part of my identity, um, and so forth. So, um, because the thing is, like, more often than not, in my experience, um, shame doesn't lead to productive outcomes. Uh, on the contrary, being ashamed of things and trying to hide things actually tends to not lead to productive outcomes. Um, and, you know, like, so I've kind of spoken about kind of the Buddhist tradition, I've, I've kind of spoken about my own tradition that I come from, but, you know, like within in secular psychology as well, um, there's kind of like this uh, kind of psychological uh, method called uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, which I had a lot of success with personally. Um, there was a ACT therapist that I, let me just also bring my camera up a bit. Um, there was a uh, ACT therapist that I saw in Cape Town for a very long time. I think that had a major influence on me and kind of my outlook on these things. Essentially, ACT um, comes down to the same thing. You know, let me just quote this um, in full. You know, in ACT, uh, the approach to shame, rather than trying to reduce or eliminate shame, psychology, psychologically accept techniques. What the grammar is almost up here. Um, <laughs> um, I think I maybe copied it incorrectly, um, but essentially the, the principle comes down to, you know, uh, we should notice shame and difficult feelings more fully. So instead of trying to avoid them, I think a lot of us that deal with mental health issues, you know, um, when so shame is one of them but but things around like anxiety or whatever our first thought is what can i do to get rid of that what can i do can i go for a jog can i like eat something emotionally can i feed some addiction can i lash out on like lash out towards someone or whatever um and the the, the problem is that you know the only real way to meaningfully like engage with it in a in a in a, a constructive way is to kind of lean more into it to kind of acknowledge it and to allow it to be what it is not to try and get rid of it um, so in other words kind of like accepting the messiness i'm not trying to have it not be there um, once again if you think about this as kind of dirt or grime or um you know, like mud or whatever, you know, like all these things that we associate with messiness, not trying to kind of wipe it off and like clean it up, um, just allowing it to be there. You know, and, and this is just because like in terms of ACT believes that in terms of outcomes, those that always has better outcomes. And um, the more we try and get rid of it, uh, the worse it 
gets you know and i think like there's this example as well you know like um in act where they talk about like um try really hard to not think about a pink elephant right now <laughs> you know so it's that thing that's like like if we just allow it to be and we don't tr like try and force it to be something it actually takes like it actually becomes it doesn't it's, it's not as salient uh, would be the word um yeah, and, and not only do we accept it, but it's once again, it comes back to, and this is where I draw a lot of parallels between the world of product design is, you know, we don't just accept something. We don't just make something messy, put it out there and say, you know, sucks to be you guys, here's a chat app. You know, it doesn't work that well, it's full of bugs, but you know, um, lean, agile, buzzwords, you know, <laughs> like your problem. Um, the thing is that we, we don't just, push out messy things we push out messy things that aren't ready yet because we are committed to iteration and we take the response that we give to those things to kind of direct us in terms of where we should iterate um, so in other words like it's actually in in the world of lean product design like we actually advise to leave features out because if people ask for it then already you have your validation that like people want it. If you add it initially, then you need to test, are oh, people actually using it? Um, so yeah, so like it's like the point is not in terms of the messiness itself. It's that we use the messiness and kind of have a, and make a commitment to that messiness and say that we're going to channel it into something good. We're going to channel it into an ACT that talk about, about, you know, workability. And that's how you measure progress, you know, in terms of workability. Um, how, like, workable are you making something? Um, so, you know, like, progress isn't like in how perfect you get it. If you never drink, uh, like, a glass of wine ever again, um, or you don't, whatever, you know, if you have addictions or if you have anxiety or whatever, it's never to feel anxious again, never to, like, it's not in terms of, it's in terms of workability. Is your solution to this problem getting more workable? Like, are you actually, because a lot of times we kind of fool ourselves by thinking, you know, it's a, a classic thing of like, okay, just this one more time and next time I'm going to, get it perfectly right. I'm going to let myself go now. And then the next time I'm going to get it perfectly right. And, you know, so like ACT says, essentially, like trying thinking in terms of kind of this, this like all or nothing approach is part of the problem. Thinking that we should get it completely gone is part of the problem. Um, and the, 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 the reality is, and, and, and the more productive way of thinking about it is to accept that it is going to be there it's never going to go away and how are we going to work with that or not to say that it's never going to go away but be open to the possibility that it might never go away um how do we work around that um you know and once again you know bringing this all the way back and like it's interesting to me that kind of lean takes the same approach where you know you measure progress by means of learning, by means of understanding something better, instead of trying like focusing too much on the product in terms of like, I, I think I had a quote earlier where I said, we're kind of free now not to pursue uh, a, a perfect product, but to pursue a perfect understanding, I think. And, and, and to me, that's really great is that don't overly focus on the outcomes, um, focus on what you can do with those outcomes. Where can you channel this? Even if it's a negative outcome, how can you channel this into something positive? Um, because trying to get rid of all negative outcomes, whether that's emotions or feelings, or in my case, you know, bloating in, in the middle of a presentation, like, that makes it worse. Um, accepting that those negative outcomes are a fact of life, and, you know, if you don't have them, that's a bonus. But, you know, it's, it's almost this thing, you know, um, the, like it says, hope for the best and plan for the worst. Um, like I tend to also say, like, you know, hope for the best, but be content with the worst. You know, if the worst were to happen, we work with that. Um, so it's about kind of like this, this developing this, this, this mental, 
um, flexibility. And I think that can only come from letting go of our, our desire to be perfect and to have it nailed down and to seem to have everything figured out and to like have all the answers, be the best designer, be the best programmer, um, be the best employee, not like seem, not appearing like you don't know something, not like building something that really sucks and people laugh at and so forth. I think by letting that go. And the thing isn't when you let that go that now all of a sudden, oh, you're going to be like this amazing person. It's, you know, like, and I think that's the key as well. Like, it's not a means to an end. Like, it's, it's accepting the fact that that is just a part of reality. Um, yeah, so um, I think that kind of summarizes it from my side. I, I just quickly want to touch on some resources that I found very helpful. There's loads of resources out there, um, but I want to speak specifically to the ones that I found really helpful. So I think first and foremost, I cannot stress enough how helpful I found support groups. Um, so SADAG, which is a South African, I think it's South African depression and anxiety group or something. Um, I'll have to go check. They run loads of support groups all across the country. I, I used to go to one in Kenilworth for a very, very long time. I kind of developed very close relationships with everyone there. Um, if you are struggling with problems, um, if you feel that, you know, like, I, like, there's definitely some mental things I need to work on. I'm not in a great space. Um, like, there's a lot of stuff that I've really been, like, pushing down and so forth. Um, I would reach out to Saturday. I would give them a call and um, just ask, is there a support group in, 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 in the area? Um, what's the closest one? Can they maybe put you in touch with someone? So they need to put you in touch because obviously you don't want anyone to just show up. You want it to be kind of a safe space. And like, if you have 50 million diagnosed conditions, even better, you know, <laughs> then at least you show up there and they're like, hey, and you can say, hey, listen, guys, this is the reason I'm here. But even if you don't, even if it's just like, you know, I'm going through something really tough, um, I would also encourage you to kind of do, like reach out to SADAG and have them put you in touch with the support group. Um, I'm not 100% sure, like, you know, there's obviously some complications with COVID and so forth, but um, I cannot stress this enough. To me, this for me is um, even before, like, getting in touch with a psychologist or whatever, um, I think support groups are not mentioned enough. Um, I have personally gotten a lot of benefit from them. Um, yeah, then, secondly, as, as mentioned, and once again, they don't cost anything. You know, a lot of people say, like, I can't go to a psychologist or whatever, because it costs, and it does indeed, it's, it's super expensive. Why does my camera all the time go upwards? Um, but it is, yeah, it, it is super expensive. I, I get that. Um, especially if you're not on medical, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm just on a bank, um, not a bank, a, a hospital plan. So, you know, like it, I pay out of pocket and it, it is expensive, but I definitely can do that. Um, support groups are obviously free. Um, if you're looking for a psychologist um, or a psychiatrist or just someone to talk to, um, therapist, counselor, whatever, uh, therapistdirectory.co.za is really great. Um, there's a lot of filters you can filter by specific issues you can filter by do you want to talk to uh, someone who's male or someone who's female or do you want to talk to someone who's you know like whatever you know um because all of us are comfortable with certain things and you know like also do you want to talk about this specific thing um like it's, it's really great there's like loads of categories where you can filter if you're struggling with something specific um and then, you know, lastly, so once again, a lot of people mentioned, you know, like it is quite expensive and it is unfortunately. Um, what I've had a lot of success with, um, specifically before I got into the world of tech, um, because, you know, so my background is in visual arts, so 
yeah, um, I, I had to live all potatoes and beans for a very long time in my life. Um, reach out to kind of like medical universities and things in your area. So I actually got in touch with Grote Skier and I asked, you know, are there any kind of students currently doing their practical um, in psychology or whatever? Um, it's possible that I can maybe just see them and they hooked me up. And I, like I, I think the session was like 15 rand or 20 rand a session. Um, it was literally just to use the facility at the hospital. Uh, we did the sessions. That was the only cost involved because they needed to gain practical experience. Um, yeah, so definitely, um, definitely, if, if, if finances is an issue, reach out to kind of like um, local medical university or whatever in your area. And here, if there are people studying within this field, um, you maybe want to kind of like who you can see or whatever. Um, and then there's a really great resource. So once again, I think first call is always, uh, SADAG has loads of emergency lines. If you are struggling with something and you need help right now, I would definitely call one of these. If you go on their website, it is on the sidebar there. Um, but then like there's also a, a really great initiative uh, called crisistextline.org. Um, they have loads of like uh, actual phone numbers that you can dial in specific countries. South Africa, unfortunately not, but you can um, send a WhatsApp message on their website. There is a WhatsApp um, number or even a Facebook message. Um, and they have like actual trained, um, like uh, people manning the crisis line. Then there's something else called Seven Cups, uh, which I've used in the past. Uh, be mindful, this is completely volunteer based. So it's not actually trained, professionally trained people like crisis counselors. Um, and I think they intentionally make it clear that this is just if you want someone to listen. So there are volunteers and you, you go through some volunteer training, um, but it's more just meant for listening. You know, listen, I just want to talk to someone. It's not like I'm in a crisis. I really need help right now. That's not the place. But if you just want to talk calmly to someone about something that's bothering you, or you just need some support, like it's, it's really great. And, you know, for both uh, Crisis Text Line, SADAG, all of these things, you know, like, most of these are based on a volunteer basis. SADAG also has volunteers. Um, please, if this is something that you care about, um, even if you don't struggle with anything yourself, I'd actually say, especially if you don't struggle with something yourself, because you know, like you tend to then probably have a bit more like uh, emotional resources to deal with these type of things than people are already inside it. Um, definitely, if you're feeling compelled, see if you can volunteer on some of these platforms. Um, they really help a lot of people. Um, and then there's a really great uh, thing. I feel like this is some of the, this, the polls and surveys that I linked. Uh, it's an organization called Open Sourcing Mental Illness, specifically with kind of um, mental illness and mental health within the tech sector. They are osmehelp.org. Uh, they have a lot of great resources. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of it is specifically aimed at America. So, you know, just like what, like what are your rights within a workplace and so forth? I've always wanted to do something like this specifically for South Africa, um, just in terms of like kind of the medical age and whatever, if you're someone struggling with mental illness, like what are the considerations in terms of medical aids? What are your rights as an employee um, and so forth and so forth, uh, legally and so forth. But yeah, it's still worth checking it out. It's, it's really great to have a lot of like surveys and, and data and so forth. Lastly, this is just personally. Um, so there's a guy called Paul Gil Martin, um, comedian. He, for a very, very long time now, does a show called The Mental Illness Happy Hour. He himself struggles with loads of issues. Um, it has helped me a ton. Fair warning, you know, as most comedians, he is pretty abrasive, sometimes pretty vulgar, but um, you know, I think that to me is part of the appeal that like it's it's just so raw, um, you know, and kind of he speaks to people 
various people he was struggling with specific things he speaks to psychologists and you know like since he's a comedian it's also pretty entertaining so it's really great and um, i've like I've, I've really been inspired just by how open he is and how matter of fact he is about most of the things that he struggles with and then lastly um some of the people that joined today might have even come from here so on zeratech.co.za so there's a community called zeratech um i'm actually an admin on there um so it's a slack workspace for everyone in the tech channel um i think we're up to like 13 or 14,000 users um there is a specific mental health channel um before this talk i actually asked a couple of questions on there i asked like what are things worth sharing and what would be valuable to share with other people and, and, and so forth so if you are already already on zenetech uh, definitely join us in, in the mental health channel and yes usually when i press the next button and nothing happens uh, that's an indication that i am done <laughs> Sometimes I forget which is the last line as well. Um, yeah, so that's basically it from my side. Um, as mentioned, this is the first time I'm talking about it. Um, so, in thematically, um, it is meant to be quite messy, um, intentionally so as well. Um, yeah, and like, yeah, it's it's been a it's been a stressful. An uncomfortable experience for me, but uh, definitely a good experience. Yeah, I hope it's of value to someone. Thank you again to Skulk for coming back and finishing this talk. Thank you for your honesty, your vulnerability, and for sharing all about your journey and your exploration into mental health and managing your well being. I want to remind everyone that. This is a taboo topic that really shouldn't be a taboo topic. If you need support, please consult the resources in the description box. Speak to someone if you need to. And remember, that you are not alone. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now.